this morning with the start of the can you get me a song? This morning we will start with the hymn 189. The Lord our rock. from John 17 in the verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they might know the, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. With those uh, words in mind, we will come to our knees with an opening prayer. Our dear Father, God, before we come this morning, we thank you for everything that you have done for us. Especially this morning we come, we ask thee for thy grace. Be with us that we may know thee, the true God, that we know where the source of wisdom and knowledge comes from. Remember us that we are only dust and the only future we have in thee. We thank thee for everything that you have done for us so far and be with us this morning that we may learn of thee. May you strengthen the thoughts and the lips of the speaker, that we may present thy words, thy words of truth. Amen. Amen. Uh, 
We welcome you all this morning. Can you give me a little bit more sound, please? Is it any better? Okay, maybe now it's better, sorry. Welcome you all this morning for the church. And uh, I see a couple of faces here that we don't know. We don't see them every Sabbath, and we would like to welcome you. Sorry, I didn't get a list of uh, all the visitors. But some of you, we, we know each other already well, and some of us uh, are uh, very happy for you to be here. <laughs> Uh, today, uh, it's a beautiful day, and we are here in the God's house, and we are happy that we can be here. And especially my family is very happy to be here, and very thankful for all of us, or all of you, to have shown your kindness and, uh, uh, in, our, in the days where we had difficulty. And, uh, only, uh, only God is the one that can truly heal our hearts. But it is very nice to see kindness and, uh, uh, of our brethren and our uh, friends. Uh, today we have a lunch, and we are all invited to be here for lunch. And we'll be a potluck uh, as soon as we finish the service. And uh, I, without uh, prolonging much, uh, we have uh, children that have prepared a special uh, offering. We should do the first offering. Uh, please, ushers, if you can come forward for the offering. for the offering and tithes may be used for honor and glory to God. Children are ready to cheer us up and they have a beautiful song that they have prepared this morning.
thank you girls and boys. Uh, it's a beautiful song. Um, we'll continue with our opening song, 182. Pass me not a gentle savior. 182. opportunity to uh, be here and to hear uh, our resident pastor on the topic, the science of salvation. brothers and sisters, we are not so many in number this morning here in the church. Some of our brethren have gone to Elmira, New York, to visit uh, our fledgling church there after the sickness of Brother DePaul, Richard DePaul. I'm glad that we are able to support and help the church. But those who are here, we are assembled here to today in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the precious truth for this time that is revealed in his holy word is actually the foundation upon which we built. This week has been a difficult week for many of us. 
we have experienced sadness, but at the same time, as Markham said this morning very aptly, very appropriately, we also have experienced hope. And sometimes we have to be reminded that there is the end of the journey on this earth, and at the same time that this is not the end. Just a short interruption until we meet again. I'm very glad that the church pulled together in a special way and that the Lord gave us grace and wisdom to know how to comfort each other and how to help each other in time of need. We are first comforted by God and then God comforts us. And brethren, it's also a reminder that we live on a sinful planet Earth where we get sick and where we die or fall asleep, as we Christians do believe. You know, uh, some of you, some of our visitors spoke with, me, uh, spoke with me this week and said, well, how that, uh, talking about this um, sad event that we went through this week and said, well, these two months approximately we were praying for the sister. I just was drawn so close to her and to the family. And now, as we laid her to rest, I just experienced something unique. But there is also a question. We prayed, and the person was laid to rest. And we asked the question, how that can happen? But I'll tell you something. We had it in the lesson today. And I really was pleased that this lesson today dealt with this issue. You know, brother, God in his infinite love and wisdom knows much, much more than we do. Amen. So when we pray for healing, we always say, God, if this is your will, if your infinite wisdom, you know this is the best way to go. But we always commit ourselves fully in God's hands. Because you know what? For an individual who is going through severe disease and who is close with God and pouring out his or her heart to the Lord, seeking God's presence, this may be a good time to leave this earth. You know? Because you might be ready for the Redeemer, for his resurrection morning. It may be good for someone else who is surviving you. We don't know that. I know when my father was... Um, you know, he, he got very sick, and when he was declining and slowly coming down, I was praying, you know, but you know what? God, in his infinite wisdom, led the things step by step in the best way. My mom says, look, we had time to talk, and I witnessed deep spiritual um, changes not only dramatic, but you know, the person is really preparing. And when I heard about Sister Anutza and how she was having a, a poem written by her hand on a piece of paper, carrying with her all the time, singing these words, this tells you the person, person was very close with the Lord, fully focused on spiritual things. So you see, I want to comfort you, brethren. We do not know these things. This is beyond our comprehension. But we have assurance that those who love the Lord who have accepted Jesus Christ, they have no reason to fear. Because Jesus is, has conquered death. He has his resurrection and life. So we have full trust and confidence in him. Now today, brethren, I'd like to speak on something else. I'd like to speak to those who are alive. Ellen White wrote in one of her writings that death is very serious, but that life is more serious, more serious. Today I'd like to speak about a topic, science of salvation, but the first part will be about the knowledge of God. How can we know God? Well, I shared with the Aramir the Bible verses so he will be able to display, I, I don't know, is it a projector working or? Not, yeah, that's okay. Uh, I would like to say that the person 
who does not know God, that person has not yet begun to live. A person may eat and drink, you know, be merry. A person can amass fortune. He be, can be praised by men in a power of, position of power in the world. But the person who does, know, does not know God is a dead person spiritually. Do you understand that? The Bible is very clear. Jesus said to some people, let the dead bury dead. People who do not know God, who do not have Jesus Christ, they are spiritually dead. And this is why Jesus said that this is life eternal to know who? The only true God and the one whom he has sent, Jesus Christ. If you do not know God the Father, you do not know His Son, Jesus Christ, you do not know life. You live, but you are dead. Or I live, I am dead. So to put ourselves in the just relations with God is literally a matter of life and death. We must know God. We must have a relationship, saving relationship. But how can we find Him? That's a question. May I read text from Job, book of Job 23? Job was in a very straight place. He was going through a terrible ordeal. And he was seeking for God. He was looking. He was calling him. He was inviting him. And now let's read verses 3 and 9 and 8 and 9. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he does work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. You see, he was seeking for God. He was looking for him. Where is he? I want to see him. I want to meet him, but I cannot find him. Is he hiding from me? So, this search for God is a universal phenomenon all over the world. People are searching for God. But I'll tell you, there are three pathways of search that lead to a blind alley. How the French say, cul de sac. So you cannot, you go that way, you search for God, but you do not find him. And I'd like to share with you which are these ways. The first way is the way of intuition. Do we know what is intuition? This is a natural light that people have. Every human being has some, some kind of intuition. And so there are not naturally born atheists. Let me tell you that. Even people who claim they do not believe in God, they still have a notion or sense they can conceive the idea of God. When you tell them God, they know what you mean. But they say there is no God, right? <laughs> but they can imagine, they, they know. We can comprehend that concept, that being, supreme being, God. So there are no natural atheists. People make a choice to reject God. So in the regions of darkest paganism, there are traces of two innate convictions. People, even in the most primitive societies, have two convictions. One is of divine birth. And the second one is of a sinful alienation. So people, even in the dark pagan countries, they have sense of origin from some divine source. And they also feel that they have been alienated from their divine being. So this is why people in different ways, primitive ways, try to appease divine being. You know that. So you see, people everywhere have that two, those two notions. Even, you know, in a Christian world, some people have expressed it like Augustine. He said, we came forth from God and we shall be homesick or restless until we return to him. Now, when people follow intuition, you see, some individuals, even in these pagan countries, have been able to 
in a vague, vague connect with God. Uh, in the Desire of Ages, in some other writings, Ellen White says that even in these pagan countries, people who have followed this natural light that God has given to every human being have worshipped God. But there are few. Most of people who follow intuition have actually fallen into idolatry. You know that. Idols are man-made gods. So people are carving them out of wood, metal, stone, worshipping those things. But you know that people can make God even of the gray matter of the brain? You know, they can, in their imagination, create divine being, which is not true divine being. In Romans, um, uh, actually, we, we have a text in Romans 1.23, uh, if you open it, uh, I have not put it on the screen, but Apostle Paul was talking about people who have not had divine revelation and who had this natural light. And look what happened. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So if you are looking in archaeology, or anthropology, going to different places in the world, you will see what people have been worshiping. Something like human being, something with wings, reptiles, all kind of things. They were worshiping those things, man-made things or idols. Now, the second pathway to in the search for God is a path of reason. Human reason. Have you heard about rationalism in the philosophy? Ratio, human reason. And that road has been traveled by philosophers and those who join philosophers. This path is still well and alive today. Now, we know that Greece, that is a golden age of philosophy, and these philosophers, and the word philosophy is not a bad word, by the way. Uh, philosophy means, or philosophy, uh, lovers of wisdom. They were searching for God as well, you know, using human reason. So they, in Athens, they had a pantheon. And there also they had gods, different gods. And, uh, you know, they were looking for them, interestingly, when uh, Simonides was asked for a definition of God, he required a few weeks for meditation, and then he answered, the more I think of him, the more he is unknown. And you know that they had an altar for an unknown God in Athens, and Apostle Paul was there. If you uh, open... Acts 17, 23, first part. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. And Apostle Paul was in Athens and he was preaching to them that unknown God that Greeks have also you know, dedicated an altar to. So you had all these philosophic schools. They were searching for God. I mean, you can uh, Stoics. Epicureans, cynics, and peripatetics, all were following the natural the light of the reason to find God. Apostle Paul came to them and preached the true God. So this uh, stocking trade of philosophy is still very much present today, and people are still following that. Now, I'll tell you, uh, even in theology and in philosophy, People have tried by using reason to prove the existence of God. And there are four major arguments for the existence of God that are known in philosophy and theology. They're not necessarily bad, but I'll tell you they are limited. They do not necessarily give you full revelation and knowledge of God. I will just briefly mention them because this is not the subject matter of our a sermon today, for example, ontological reasons. Ontos in, in Greek means a being. So from the concept or, or being of God, idea of God, you derive the existence of God, the highest imaginable being. But as I mentioned, uh, 
philosophers have also argued against that uh, proof and trying to, to demonstrate that this does not necessarily 100% prove existence of God. There is a cosmological argument, uh, reasoning from effect to cause, because when you see things outside, you are thinking about the cause, how this came into existence and how that came into existence, and so you are coming to the first cause. This is cosmological argument. And then there, there, is, there are other arguments. There is a so-called teleological. Telos in Greek means the, the purpose. So in that way, when you see order in the universe, when you see perfect you know, uh, design, be it human being or being a plant world or animals or whatsoever, you look at the planets, you are thinking there must be designer, there must be a mind behind that. You see, this is another argument. And anthropological argument, for example, when we look at a man, a man has a moral, moral sense, a moral code, moral uh, judgment. So where is that coming from? How do we know what is right and wrong? Even in the most primitive societies, people have, they can differentiate between right and wrong. So see, these are different arguments that people have used. But reason by itself, let me tell you, I'm not saying that uh, reasoning is bad. We should use reason, but this does not lead, uh, lead you to the full knowledge and revelation of God. Uh, one good example uh, is um, Apostle Paul and even Jesus Christ praised God and said, Father, I thank you that you have hidden these things from those who are wise and that you have revealed them to those who are simple. Apostle Paul also said the same thing, that those who are wise in this world, they have not known the Lord, but those who are simple, who are looked as fools in this world, God has enlightened them. You see, the knowledge... There are two kinds of knowledge. Uh, one is the knowledge that we can obtain through our, you know, using our, our reasoning powers. But the other knowledge is the knowledge coming by faith. Uh, one example I can bring to you, John Hay is a well-known American uh, statesman. He was the secretary, personal secretary of President of Abraham Lincoln from even his early years and later on when he came to power, Lincoln, he was uh, his assistant and he was actually later on Secretary of State. He wrote a 10 volume biography of Abraham Lincoln. He knew a lot about him. But uh, Lincoln's son, Tad, did not write a book, but he knew his father personally very well. So you see, there are different types of knowledge and information that you obtain. So, Jesus said also in, uh, in uh, Matthew 18, verse 3, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we need that simplicity, trust of a child to be able to, that God may reveal to us his truth and himself. Now the third way, I mentioned first intuition, second reason. The third way is also a well-known way. It's through our senses. And this is called also empiricism. Heard about David Hume, English philosopher. They were believing that, well, a man can sense things. And children, there are five senses. Four of them are on the in the head. Eyes, ears, smell, and taste. And the fifth one is touch. Now, there is a sixth sense. We will mention that in a moment. But he was believing that using the senses, we can discover the world around us and then go little by little, step by step, and then come to the, you know, the original uh, ultimate reality, what is behind the, wor the world that is around us. We call it natural science, natural sciences. So... Uh, but Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now please understand, the science has its legitimate sphere, but when you come to the knowledge of God and spiritual things, you cannot use natural sciences to understand the nature of God fully. 
We can know something about God by observing his created you know, world, uh, but we cannot know God. We cannot understand fully without spiritual revelation. Now, when we talk about faith, faith is not credulity. Credulity means that somebody believes without evidence. As I mentioned before, Christian faith, biblical faith, is based on evidence. We are not jumping into dark. God has given us sufficient evidence that we can trust him. Did Adam and Eve have sufficient evidence to trust God? Did they? Yes, they did. They, God created perfect environment for them. He created them in his own image. He provided, he satisfied all their needs. He was managing that universe. He put them there to be stewards. You know, so many evidences of, did they have reason to trust God's, to doubt God's existence? <laughs> no way. So you see, and they still fail. So this tells us that God gives evidence. And by the way, the lack, you see, the problem in the Garden of Eden was not lack of evidence. But they still exercised unbelief in spite of the ability to see God face to face. Do you understand that? God was there every day meeting with them in the cool of the day. He created them. And they still distrusted him. They did not believe him. This is why Jesus said, even if somebody would resurrect from the dead, if they don't believe Moses and prophets, they will not believe in him. They will not believe in God. They will not believe in me. So, Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Often people, even approaching Bible and theology, are saying, well, we have to use scientific method. And you know how they try to do it? They're trying to do it in, in such a way like you know, proposing an algebraic you know, problem or setting it you know, before them. Let this be, you know, God is unknown term. Let this be expressed by X. And then the problem then is to resolve X into known terms by the use of a multitude of seen and tangible facts. So what do we have? We are going from cosmos, this world that we see today. We go to chaos because they believe, oh, well, before this order, there was a chaotic situation. And then before this chaos, then there is a primordial soup. And then primordial soup, you're going to atoms. And then you come to atoms, and then you're kind of, you know, sub-particles of atoms. And where do you come? You need something after that. You need the first cause. Now, as I mentioned uh, last time I spoke here, now they are saying, because they, the science proved that it was a, the universe is not eternal, it had a beginning. So what they are saying, there was a big bang. From at some point, you know, everything came into existence. But now the question is, what was before the big, big bang? And what they are saying now, there was nothing. Now, could you imagine that? Nothing. Well, we agree there was nothing except there was a, Something <laughs> with nothing. There was creator, the creator. You see how people are fools. I mean, literally fools. That they believe that everything came out of nothing. Without the first cause, without the creator. So this is what the Bible says in their wisdom, they went into foolishness. One man, educated man, said we have educated ourselves into imbecility. And, and, and this is the reality of the present world. This is when you leave God where you end, in darkness, groping. These are blind alleys, intuition, reason alone, unaided by divine revelation, and empiricism. So we need something else. Yes, there is a fourth road. And this is highway cast up by God himself. 
it is called revelation or unveiling. Now, if there is a God who created this universe, do you believe that this God would leave himself without any witness of his existence, that he would not show, demonstrate to man, show something? I don't believe so. If there is a God who created this universe so beautifully and perfectly, I believe that this God would show or reveal himself to human beings. And he indeed did reveal himself. Now we call this revelation the Bible. We call it God's word. We call it the scriptures. And these scriptures make a unique claim like no other book in the world. This Bible claims that it has come into existence by divine inspiration. We have this text in 2 Peter 1.21. For the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So another text, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created. The Bible tells you clearly how everything came to existence. God created the heavens and the earth. God created the plants. God created the rocks and the seas and the animals, and he created us in his own image. This is how we came into existence. And then God created through the word. And who is the word? A medium. Jesus Christ. Logos. Eternal Logos. So God communicates with his creation through his word and also through the the word in a unique sense, Jesus Christ. Now, then we have a, a, some indication about that, something coming. And uh, so, Bible tells us actually clearly in, in the Revelation that God is the creator, that is an act of creation, and then there is divine providence. God sustains or maintains the universe. So the world is sustained by God's power. But there is something in between. There is creation and sustenance. There is a person, a figure who appears on the scene. And uh, that mysterious figure is first mentioned in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, that figure is in the Old Testament sometimes represented as a king, a royal personage, and sometimes as a suffering servant. Now, the tragedy of the Jewish people is that they did not recognize him in these two forms. They just saw the Messiah as a royal personage, did not see him as a suffering servant. Even today, with the Jewish people, that's a problem. They did not see it clearly. But thank God, some do see. And the other text that are beautiful, Matthew 1.23, Behold, the virgin shall be with a child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. This is the name of Jesus Christ. This is the name of the one whom God has sent to us. And uh, if you read another text, John 1.14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, if I may just say, that divine revelation in his word, and I hope you will understand me, is insufficient for salvation. Please, listen carefully to the end. Unless in that word you find who? Christ. What did Jesus say to the Jews? You search the scriptures, thinking that in them you have eternal life, but they testify of me. If we search the scriptures and do not find Jesus Christ, we have not found God. 
We just have knowledge about many facts, but we have not found him. In uh, John 1.18, we have a text, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. See, Jesus Christ is the explicit, direct revelation of the Father. In the beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 1.14, John 1.14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You see, in the Old Testament times, the Jews were always expecting, God's people expecting that God will come. He will dwell with his people. You see, God was dwelling in the, as they were traveling through the wilderness. Uh, he was the pillar of fire and then the cloud in the night. Actually, cloud, uh, pillar of fire in the, in the night and cloud in the, during the day. Then God was present in the most holy place. And then when there was a temple in Jerusalem, God was present in the most holy place there. But now when people were going into apostasy, God's presence was withdrawn from the holy temple. And if you read the book of Ezekiel, you, you can find in chapters, I think chapter 11, you see Ezekiel saw that the glory of God was departing from the most holy place, first to the threshold of the temple, and from the threshold he saw these wheels and angels, and the glory went to the mountain outside of the temple. And then, you know, God's glory disappeared. And they say, glory of God will be revealed again in Jerusalem, in Israel. And they were waiting how God will appear. And then, you know, what happens when Jesus was born in Jerusalem and when the apostles later on found who he was, John is saying, we have seen him, God in the flesh. God dwelt among us. We, what we have seen, what we have touched, what we have heard, with our fingers what we have touched, we tell you about this, that God was revealed. In Jesus Christ. So this is the fifth way of revelation. So we have the three one, which are blind alleys. The fourth one is the revelation through the scripture, which leads you to the fifth one, which is the incarnate word, God himself in the flesh. And now, when we come to this point, What can we say? Have you ever seen a child lost among the strangers? I've seen it a few times. I've seen wild eyes. I've seen them just sobbing and trembling and looking for a mother or father. And no one can comfort and console the child. He's so, she's so terrified. And when the mother comes, you know, oh, and takes the child up and puts to the breast, you know, to the, the child is sobbing out, you know, and, and happy mommy is there. You, you found your parent. So you see, this is the condition of a sinner without God. We are lost. We are groping in darkness. We are having fear, ex existential fear of tomorrow, what will happen. But when you find God through Jesus Christ, he takes that fear away from you. Philosophers cannot find it. Paganism cannot offer it. Science cannot offer it. But the faith and the word of God and Jesus Christ can give you that assurance, that peace, what you're looking for all your life. You find it in him. He said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one can come to God except by me. See, we are blessed people that we know these truths. And our children should know these truths. Because people are searching in vain. Many people looking for God. They cannot find him. But he's not far away from us. He's close. Now, I'd like to just briefly say, Jesus told us something about that God. He loved to talk about his father. He liked to start his speeches like, the kingdom of God is like this, or kingdom of God is like that. He was talking about, you know, a master, a father who had sons, right? 
And the Father was always there. You see, when you interpret parables of Christ, please remember that you have to always interpret the characters in the parable and identify who they stand for. Typically, there is a triad. You are having a father or master or someone, and then there are two classes of people. But you see, there are beautiful examples in these parables about who is the father, how much he cares about his creation. And, and then you can see how he providentially. Uh, I will just read a few, few um, statements. First of all, he said about God's being. He said, John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So you see, we have... We are worshiping spiritually, not created image or object in spirit, but also in truth. It's not just nebulous, uh, some spiritual, that truth guides you to God. Now, Luke 12, 27, 28. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. But if God so clothes the grass in the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace. How much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? He was telling us, don't worry so much about tomorrow. I will take care. God takes care of the flowers. He will take care of you. Matthew 7, 7 11, and 11. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and shall be opened unto you. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good Give good things to them that ask of him. Ask of him. So you see, brethren, when our children are asking something of us, how eager we are to help them, to do whatever it takes. But the Father in heaven, how much more he is eager to help us. Now, he is calling us to holiness. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. But what else does he say? You are the light of the world. Do you see that? If you are a follower of Christ, you are also light of the world. You read Matthew 5, 14 and 16. You are light of the world. A city that is set on a hill, it cannot be hid. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And then he told us about holiness of God. I don't now have time to go into that. I will briefly mention he told us that God's government has two arms. One is the arm of justice and the other arm is love and mercy. What did he say? Don't think I have come to destroy the law and prophets. I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. But at the same time he said what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord thy God and love thy neighbor as thyself. You see, this is what Jesus told us about God's holiness and his. And uh, he told us to pray our Father. He told us God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. And uh, what else did he tell us? He told us that at the cross, justice and mercy have met. If you look at the text in Psalm 85, verse 10, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. When there was a need to save a man, and this is the question one of our visitors, Valentin, asked me. I have a Muslim friend. And, you know, we talk about religion. And they are having their way to salvation. And we Christians have our way. And their way doesn't have substitutionary death. There is no, you know, savior. <coughs> so why do we Christians need a savior? Why do we need a someone who has to die? Couldn't God save us without someone suffering on our behalf? This is what Muslims ask the question. Have you thought about that? So God just 
erases your sins and uh, ignores whatever, you know, has happened wrong and forgives you and you're fine, right? There is a problem because God's government demands justice. God's government is built on the principle of righteousness and justice. If somebody does wrong, there must be penalty. It cannot be overlooked. We are dying. But this is a temporary thing. You see, this is why we need a divine substitute who has to give his life. And there was a search for a volunteer. You know Isaiah 6? Isaiah, when he saw the glory of God, who will go? Here am I, send me. Now Jesus was the volunteer. He said, I will go. I will give my life for man. This is what happened. And if you read Hebrews 10, 5, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you desire not, but a body have you prepared for me. Christ was willing to take our body and to die our death. Let me just mention in the closing part, because we are today facing a lot of apostasy, and people who claim to believe in God even going wrong ways, I'd like to bring to your attention the case of Carmel, Mount Carmel, and false worshippers and true worshippers, because ultimately the great controversy will end on the issue of worship. Who do you worship and how do you worship? So what these people were doing, the, the priests of Baal, Eliak challenged them and he said, okay, let's make two altars. You offer an ox, I will offer an ox. And then they, you go first. And they were calling up on their God, oh Baal, hear us. But there was no response. Satan was eager to bring fire down, but he was prohibited. He was restrained. He could not do it. So Elijah was even uh, laughing at them. And then Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord. And then he offered the sacrifice. We read in 1 Kings 18, 20, 36. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, O Lord, O God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. And you know what happened? A fire came from heaven. Although there was a, they dug out, you know, the earth around a trench and they poured the water, but everything was consumed and the water disappeared. And people said, the Lord is God. You see what happened at the cross of Calvary? There was also demonstration of God's love and God's glory. But Jesus Christ was the sacrifice. He was on the altar, outstretched hands. And the fire came from heaven and consumed him. He was the burnt offering for us, for you and me. And this is how we are saved. So, and then people are still trying to find another way. But God laughs at them, laughs at them. If you read <clears throat> in Psalm 2, verses 3 and 4, what well, they say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. God is laughing at people who are searching for other ways. They want to throw off the restraint of God's law. You see the immorality unprecedented immorality in the present world. I'd like to speak on that some other time. I spoke with some brethren this week who told me, look, brethren, they are destroying marriage, completely want to obliterate the face of God or from the image of man. And the next institution will be the Sabbath. And we know what's going on, what's going to happen. And we know the man of sin 
is working full force, visiting different countries and continents and so on. And he's coming to the North America as well. He's concerned about environment because the enemy knows that there will be changes in the environment climate change, whatever the cause may be, and that the people will be rallied to worship God in a certain way that will be not God-ordained way. So you see, things are happening. Foundations are being removed. But God will rise at that time to defend his people and his downtrodden law. We have today to stand in defense of that law. We have to know God as Elijah knew him. And we have to know him as Jacob knew him. You see, we all have some inherited and cultivated wrongs and tendencies. And as often we mention, we have to come up higher. But this man, Jacob, had a unique experience. He was about to meet his brother, who was coming as an enemy. And he was meeting God in the night at that brook. And there was wrestling. Omnipotence met him. And at some point, he hit him and crippled him. He fell to the ground. But he held on to him and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. <clears throat> Verse Genesis 32, 26. And he said, let me go for the day break it. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And look what the divine visitor said. Verses 27, 28. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed. And he blessed him there. This is the experience that God's people need to have. Because they will go through time of Jacob's trouble. We know that. And look what is very interesting as this passage closes. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. He met God face to face. He was limping. We might be limping. We may have experienced some loss in some way. But if we have met God, oh, praise his name. Praise his name. This is a new experience. Completely new experience. We need that experience. Right now, right today. And Jesus Christ, when he resurrected, you know that Thomas did not believe? And what did Jesus tell him? John 20, 27. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and trust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. What did Thomas say after he touched the Lord? Lord Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen me or touched me, but who believe. I wish that you, brother and sister, and dear ch children, that you may have this experience today. May God help us. Amen. Uh. With the solemn words of the hymn, Take Time to Be Holy, 364, will conclude our morning's meeting.
gracious and loving Father in heaven, we come to your throne of grace to thank you, Lord, that you have been such a kind and caring Father, that you have uh, given the greatest gift of heaven, the Son, Jesus Christ, that we may have hope in eternal life. We thank you for revealing yourself to us in nature. We thank you for giving us reasoning powers. We thank you for giving us senses that we may, that we may experience this world. But Father, above all, we thank you for that revelation in the Holy Word, in the Holy Scriptures. And the greatest revelation of all, the incarnate Word, Jesus Christ, who became flesh. Oh, we pray, Father, that we may realize what you have done for us. That we may not grope into, in darkness, but we may come to the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And this light shines upon every human being. Oh, may we come to that light and get to know you personally. May we surrender our lives fully to you. May we receive your righteousness and by faith accept thy grace. O oh Lord, I pray for those who are in sorrow among us, that you may comfort them, and that we may understand, Lord, that you, even when we go through difficult times, that you are very close to us. You will never abandon those who love you and trust you. We pray that you give us strength and courage as we move forward. We know that we will be entering into the last great battle. We know that the enemy is marshalling his forces. We see so much darkness in the world, present world, although the world claims great enlightenment. But we see the great darkness covering the people. But Father, you have given great light to thy people. That light is in Jesus Christ, in thy holy word. Help us, Lord, to be witnesses for you. Let us be light in the world, city on the hill, that we may glorify you and vindicate thy government. O oh Lord, bless our young people. Help them that they may find you. Bless our visitors that they may find you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Give us peace in the remaining hours of the blessed Sabbath day. Be with those who are discouraged. Be with those who are in sorrow. Be with those who are sick. O oh Lord, you know what is best for us. We commit ourselves fully into thy hands. And we thank you for everything you have done. And we pray for that touch of thy love that will transform us and bring us closer to you. That our names also could be changed. That we receive the victorious name. Only those who overcome, Jesus said, will be sitting with him on his throne. May we be among them. We ask all these things and we ask for forgiveness of our sins. Not because we are worthy, we ask. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you all for being with us this morning. And uh, we'll continue the fellowship, having lunch together, and the rest of the day. We'll be ushered out.